Hi, my name is Garth Greenwell. I'm the author of Cleanness, or Pureté en français, um, which has just been published by Grasset. I'm very happy to be part of the Festival et Fraction this year, even if only virtually. So Cleanness is narrated by an American man living and teaching in Sofia, Bulgaria. If I had to offer a summary of the book in a single word, I think the word would be intimacy. At the heart of the book is a love story between the narrator and another foreigner, a younger uh, Portuguese man who is spending a semester studying in Sofia. But the book is also about intimacies of different kinds. So there's romantic intimacy. There's also um, the intimacy of sexual encounters that are not romantic, um, sexual encounters with strangers. Uh, there's the intimacy that exists between teachers and students and the question of what it means to be a mentor to a young person. And then there's also, I think, the question of um, what is the weird intimacy that is citizenship, that is belonging to a place or not belonging to a place. And what that feels like and what it might mean to participate in the life of a country, either as a citizen or as a foreigner. The second question is about this label, autofiction, and whether it um, feels meaningful to me in relation to my own work. And the answer is not really. Um, it's not entirely clear to me what we think is new about autofiction. It seems to me that um, writers have always turned to their own lives for material which they then process in various ways and transform to make useful for their art. Um, if I think about a tradition of writing that does feel meaningful to me and that I think many of the writers we talk about under this label of haute fiction are, are inheriting and working with, it is the tradition of the novel of consciousness an attempt to put on the page what thinking feels like, what consciousness feels like. Um, that also is a very old game in literature. I think um, the writer who, to my mind, kind of invented those resources is St. Augustine, who in the Confessions kind of invented a way of putting consciousness onto the page. And I think, um, you know, certainly there is a tradition of novel writing that emerges maybe especially at the end of the 19th century that I think is inspired by phenomenological philosophy and um, is interested in um, the interior, in the texture of a life and trying to put the texture of existence on the page. And I would think of writers like Proust, obviously also Henry James, Virginia Woolf, James Baldwin, um, moving forward through writers like W.G. Zabalds, um, and many writers today, as I say, who are often talked about in terms of autofiction, like Knausgaard or Ben Lerner or Edouard Louis, it does seem to me that they are working with um, this tradition of the novel of consciousness. Um, I don't think in the past couple of decades a kind of new way of doing literature that deserves a new term like haute fiction has been invented. I think um, what we're doing on the page is trying to make use of um, resources that have existed for a long time and to play a game that is in fact very old. I feel very strongly resistant to any idea of necessity um, in relation to art, um, whether art by queer artists or art in general. 
Um, so no, I don't think that there is some necessity in queer art for the use of autobiography. Um, it's very clear to me and has been clear since um, the first sentences that I wrote that what I am writing is fiction, not autobiography. And that even where my work makes use of autobiographical material or autobiographical circumstances, as it certainly does, that that autobiographical material is being treated in a way that I think is maybe analogous to how a visual artist might make use of found material. So if a visual artist picks up a piece of trash from the street and takes it to their studio and paints it and cuts it or pours whatever on it, processes it in various aesthetic ways in order to make it into an object that they then place within a frame or on a pedestal. Well, it seems to me that that piece of reality has been importantly severed from its real context. It's been made into an aesthetic object. Um, in that same way, when I make use of autobiographical material, I'm doing so in a way that is aesthetic. Um, to me, it, it does feel important, and writers feel differently about this, and that's fine. But to me, it does feel important that if one writes something that one calls nonfiction, that one is declaring a kind of allegiance to the truth. I feel no such allegiance. Um, if I make use of autobiographical material, it's because that material feels to me aesthetically useful. And my books are full of invention. So um, while it is true that my books may make use of autobiographical material, they are absolutely not autobiograph autobiography. And there is a clear line for me between the self who is writing the book and the character who is narrating the story. What interested me in writing cleanness was not um, sexual explicitness in and of itself. Um, it was instead the idea of what might happen if one combined a kind of absolute explicitness in the description of the sexual body with a particular kind of syntax that I'm attracted to. The kind of sentence that I'm interested in writing is a sentence that has a history. It goes back to St. Augustine, whom I already mentioned. Um, and then in the devotional writers of the 16th and 17th century in English, and then through Proust and um, Henry James and Virginia Woolf. Um, it's a syntax that is at once propulsive and has a kind of forward movement, but then also is always falling back on itself in order to question itself or correct itself. It's a kind of sentence that I think of as being a little technology for the production of consciousness or for the production of inwardness. And so what interested me was combining sexual explicitness in an attempt to write, to push myself to write the sexual body um, as explicitly as I could with this technology for the production of inwardness. That's what seemed exciting to me. And it, it also seemed to me, um, so it's, it seemed to me that it might be productive of revelation of a kind of discovery. It also seems to me that it is a way in which literature might have an important intervention to perform in the way that our culture represents sex. One reason that I think explicitness in and of itself is not super interesting necessarily is that you know, we live in a moment in a culture in which we are absolutely inundated with explicit images of sexual bodies. Um, to an extent that is utterly unprecedented in the history of the world. We can go on the internet and see absolutely everything. And yet it also seems to me true that our culture suffers from a dearth of what I think of as representations of embodiedness, by which I mean bodies that have consciousness. Um, very often, it seems to me, though I'm, I'm not at all someone who is anti-pornography, but very often it does seem to me that um, in certain kinds of especially internet porn, um, it can seem as though these sexual bodies are being represented in a way that deliberately expunges them of consciousness, that strips them of personhood. Well, literature, I think, is the great technology for the communication of consciousness, for the communication of what 
life feels like from the inside. And so it was that combination between um, you know, what might happen, what discoveries might we make, what kind of research into the human could we attempt by combining sexual explicitness with this kind of phenomenological consciousness producing sentence. That was what excited me in the, in the book. It's also why um, at some point in talking about the book, I've said that I wanted to write something that was 100% pornographic and 100% high art. Um, neither of those things maybe is necessarily so interesting on their own, but the combination to me seemed and seems exciting. When thinking about writing sex, I have two entirely contradictory beliefs. Um, on one hand, I do think that sex is one of our most intense and densely impacted forms of communication. I think sex also, um, to me, seems revelatory of the human in particular ways. Um, when I think about sex, I often think that um, sex engages certain contradictions of humanness in a way that is illuminative. So there's a way in which when we're having sex, we are at once kind of having an intense experience of our physical bodies. And yet also I think sex gives us our most intense experience of something that seems to us like it exceeds those bodies. I think sex is the source of all our metaphysics. Um, you know, sex is an experience that um, sort of in some ways is one of our most unmediatedly biological animal experiences. And yet, on the other hand, at the same time, it is one of our most culturally and historically determined experiences. So in these ways, the way that sex engages these contradictions, um, I want to say that sex does offer an artist a kind of privileged viewpoint or access to the human. So that's one of my beliefs, like sex is special. And for that reason, there might well be difficulties in writing sex that would be particular to, to, to that attempt. On the other hand, it also seems to me that um, writing sex is no different from writing anything else, and that in fact, writing anything is really impossible or almost impossible, that it is impossible actually to um, really put on the page what it was like to eat uh, a muffin in the morning or what sunlight feels like. Um, and that, in fact, the discipline of writing sex is the same as the discipline of writing anything, that it is an attempt to see something clearly and to make that experience available to the reader. So I want it both ways. Sex is special and sex is exactly the same as everything else when it comes to putting it on the page. It is important to my sense of what art is that I do not make art to make statements. I, um, if I have a statement I want to make, um, then I have other ways of communicating that. Um, the reason I make art is because there are situations or problems or dilemmas that seem to me so difficult, so complicated, that they defeat all my other tools of thinking. If I could reason about something, then I wouldn't need to make art. If I could um, make an argument, I wouldn't need to make art. Instead, um, you know, there are certain experiences of complexity that I feel like in order to think about them and to think about them in the fullness of my, not just intellectual, but also ethical and emotional um, apparatus that I need the peculiar pressure of seeing the peculiar pressure of the kind of syntax I'm attracted to. You know, very often when I look at human life, I feel like I am staring into an abyss. And for me, art is the instrument I have for navigating the abyss. So, um, I only make art when I don't know what I want to say. At the same time, um, it is true that 
I think, for a queer writer to write sex, um, that it will be seen as a kind of statement, at least. Um, it does seem to me true that when we make art out of something, when we put a frame around something, we are making a claim about its value. We're making a claim that it does have value. We're making a claim that it is something that is worthy of you know, the peculiar dignity that art can bestow. And it does seem to me, even in an age of marriage equality, that um, certainly in the United States, um, the, the, the queer body is still, and especially the queer sexual body, is still something that is despised. And so um, I guess I do want to think that one of the things that I'm trying to do in writing that body explicitly and writing that body also with all of the resources of the English lyric tradition, the English language lyric tradition, that I am taking this body that has been despised and trying to cherish it and trying to lavish upon it um, a sense of the beautiful. So to that extent, I suppose, yes, it is a claim. It's a claim that um, this is um, worthy of our attention, that it's worthy of the ennoblement of art, and that um, it has a value that, like all human value, is infinite. The answer is that, yes, it is important to me in the sense that I think it is a very dangerous idea, and I think that it is something to be resisted. Um, I value as an aesthetic, as an ethic, as a way of being a human being in the world, I value impurity, um, something that I um, aim for as an aesthetic goal, something that I admire as an ethic is promiscuity. Um, one of the few things that gives me hope about human beings as a species is the extent to which we are excited by mixture, the extent to which we are excited by what happens when you bring together different things, the possibilities that that can create. Um, so that is what's aesthetically and ethically exciting to me. What I hope to do in the book, um, you know, is to face up to what seems to me true, again, about just what it means to be human and the contradictions that make up the human. One of those contradictions is that I think there is something in us that longs for purity. And as I say, um, I think that is potentially, while it can be a beautiful longing, it is potentially um, an extraordinarily dangerous longing in that if we are over attached to our desire for purity, we will turn ourselves into engines of destruction. Um, I think there is also a desire in the human for filth. I think there is a desire to bathe in filth. I think faced with this contradiction and of whole systems of thinking and philosophy and ethics have been predicated upon the idea that faced with these contradictory desires, what we must do is valorize one of those desires, the desire for cleanness, and then brutally repress the other desire, the desire to bathe in filth. One of the things that I wanted to think about in cleanness is what might it look like if instead of what seems to me always the destructive impulse to repress an element of ourself that frightens us? What if instead we tried to imagine what a life might look like that could accommodate that contradiction without attempting to resolve it? What might a life look like that would allow us to value both purity and filth and allow us, the way, allow us to see the ways in which that binary, in fact, when one looks at it hard enough, collapses? So um, pureté is not a perfect translation of cleanness. There is no perfect translation um, for the word in really in any language. It's a, a question I'm coming against in, in all of the translations of the book. 
What I do think is perfect is the cover design and the way that the design sort of brings out this pun or this play on words, wherein in pureté, one can find put. And that, I think, is maybe the deepest argument of the book or the deepest um, intuition of the book, that in cleanness we find filth and in filth we find cleanness. And the question of being a human being in the world is how can we make a life that can inhabit that truth and allow us to stand in a meaningful relation to other impure human beings? It's very hard to say anything meaningful about this uh, without going on at great length. Um, what I will say is that I do think it is extraordinary to think about the gains that queer people in certain demographics in certain very privileged places have made over the past 10 years. When I consider my own life, I'm 42 years old. I was born in a state where private homosexual relations were criminalized, where it was illegal to have gay sex. I now live in a country where um, marriage equality is recognized across the land. That's extraordinary. I think um, it's important also, though, to recognize that that battle, the battle for those rights, was fought at a cost. And that that cost came um, from you know, the fact that the marriage equality movement, at least in the United States, to a very large degree, was a kind of marketing campaign. It meant taking queer lives and packaging them in such a way that the value of those lives could be legible, could be visible to a majority, to straight people. Um, that meant further stigmatizing some of the most marginalized and already stigmatized aspects of the queer community and of queer practices. It seems to me that um, queer urban communities, not just urban communities, queer communities invented remarkable, beautiful, ethically resilient modes of sociality, often around sexual practices, often around practices of promiscuity. I'm thinking of gay male cruising here. Um, that um, this sort of promotional campaign attempted to expunge from queer history, attempted to clean away from queer history. Well, um, for me, if that's the cost at which something like marriage equality comes, I think it is too high a cost. I think much of the potential radicality of queerness inheres in um, these other forms of relation that I think still have a great deal to teach the larger culture. So yes, one of the things I do want to do in my work is to turn again to forms of queer life that are sometimes now dismissed as retrograde, um, uh, dismissed both by straight people and by certain queer people, um, to sort of say there are modes of resistance, there are modes of sociality here that are meaningful and valuable, and to attempt to treat those practices and communities with um, the kind of dignity I think they deserve. Um, that is something I would love to think that my work is attempting to do. And um, it is very kind of the question to quote this very generous thing that Edouard Louis said about pureté and its relationship to queer history. I would love to believe that that is true and that my book could be part of an attempt to turn back to queer history and recover from it some of the things um, I think we've lost. It has been such a pleasure to um, answer these questions and spend this time with you. Thank you all so much.